Coming up on Tech News Today, Twitter gets redesigned again. We'll go through the features, tell you what we like and don't like. OnLive hits the iPad as well as other mobile devices. And the Department of Homeland Security, oops, took a wrong site for a year. No harm, no foul, except is it? All coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Thursday, December 8th, 2011. Tech News Today is brought to you by the Epson Workforce Pro, the world's fastest two-sided printer, delivering high-speed two-sided color printing, copying, scanning, and faxing to keep your business running at full speed. Plus, you'll save on ink. Check out the Epson Workforce Pro this holiday season at Epson.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Aya Zaktar. And I'm Jason Howell. And joining us today, very pleased to have Mr. Andy Inotko from the Chicago Sun-Times, Inotko.com, Mac Break Weekly, and and what's, what's your other show? I'm blanking on it. Uh, the Anatko Almanac on the 5x5 five five Network. Anatko Almanac. Thank you, Andy. It's great to have you on the show. It's great to be on a show where I don't have to wake up like at the crack of 11 a.m. Now I can actually <laughs> sleep until the normal hour of 2.30 in the afternoon here. So. A much more humane hour. Absolutely. Exactly. Absolutely agree with you. I'm not a farmer. No, exactly. What are you, <laughs> getting up with the chickens? Laporte? What's up with that? Uh, Twitter got a major design overhaul today. Uh, they ha they brought a bunch of uh, press into their new uh, and still being renovated offices in San Francisco as a backdrop for the new and now renovated uh, Twitter.com. They broke it down into to four different major redesign elements. Uh, you're going to have your home button, which will be your timeline. Uh, as you are used to it. Uh, a connect button, which is the at replies, plus anything else. That that activity tab has been there. Now it's just re renamed with an at symbol. Uh, they're using the hashtag symbol for the discovery section, which is where you do your searches and see hashtags and all that sort of thing. And then the me tab, which actually doesn't show up on the website, but it does show up on the mobile uh, device, is your profile and all that stuff. So on the face of it, not too much really different in my eyes, about what's going on here. Well, they swapped the timeline placement. It used to be on the left. Now it's on the right, so it's brand new, and they have little boxes instead of being a continuous uh, pane on the short pane. But, like, I like a lot of the inline stuff that they were showing off on the old version of Twitter, that last redesign. Yeah, so instead of uh, when you click on a uh, picture and it shows up on the right side, now it's inline. Yeah, that was being tested, strangely enough, I think a couple of weeks ago before this, this officially rolled out. Because I know I was able to click on images, and it was popping down instead of to the right. I thought that was just a curiosity, but it, it looks like it's just part of this new timeline. Uh, the Merging everything and calling it Connect instead of Activity, I think that's not a bad idea. It's just branding at this point. The Discover tab, I kind of like that because sometimes to find the, the what's trending right now thing, sometimes I have to like log out of Twitter to see what's up right, right up front. It, that to me was always some kind of uh, design flaw in using the, the web version of Twitter finding what's actually going on at the same time. Plus, on the iOS app, the update on the uh, iPod Touch and iPhone, it, it's just a little, a little easier to use, I think. Andy, what do you think? Have you, have you gotten a chance to look at the new one yet? Only through videos. Uh, I, I've, like many people, I've gotten the fuzzy end of the lollipop, and I'm not so blessed as to have access to the new Twitter. But from people, I've talked to people who've used it, and I've looked, looked at the videos. I like what I see so far because I thought that I think that the current redesign, or the, the previous one, is really a clumsy hybrid between a web app and an actual web page. I mean, we've had this in place for what seven, eight months now, and still, I will instinctively click on an underlined link underneath a username, expecting to look at that person's page so I can see their previous tweets, and it never, ever, ever happens the way that I thought it would. Uh, but I think that overall, what they're trying to do is make Twitter into more of a destination than uh, it, it, an anonymous feeder of content to the mobile apps that you're using to get access to the service. I mean, if they have to sort of make Twitter to a destination so that not only, uh, just like a Flipboard, for instance, is one of my most popular uh, Twitter clients these days because it really does work the way that I like to use Twitter. It just gives me all those cool links and all those cool comments in a magazine format. So I think that they're looking at that and figuring out, gee, how come we're losing those clicks, we're losing those eyeballs? We can do something like that that gives people a feed of all the content, all the pictures, all the articles just in one window. And then hopefully we can find a way to finally make some money off of this.
They also rolled out something called brand pages, uh, okay. which are, are pages for, for brands uh, that give them a bigger uh, top level. Uh, in fact, Jason, you can take my screen if you want. Yeah. Uh, the top level is, is a bigger, uh, bigger space than you get on a regular feed, and they, it gives you a place for a logo. And then you get to pick which of your Twitter posts are promoted to the top of the feed. It doesn't just go by chronology. And then, of course, you're always going to pick one that has one of those photos that's, you know, mm. dropping down. So I'm looking at Coca-Cola's right now, and, and they have a big vault or something. I don't know what it has to do with Coke. But it's at the, the heart yes. of Coca-Cola. There's a secret, and then they have a picture of a vault. So it's some, which is some, open, which is not a good thing. If the secret's in yeah, there. Yeah, apparently the secret's gone. Somebody walked in there and so took it. So if you're it. at Coke and you see your own tweet stream there, uh, timeline, close the vault. <laughs> It really does, this doesn't look too much different from the other uh, the other accounts on Twitter. Just that that bigger uh, that bigger what you call it. We get a banner on the top. Banner yeah. on the top. Yeah, exactly. So you, get, you get to brand it a little bit better. I mean, it, it it's just another. It just, I mean, I say this about Twitter a lot. It's it's it was a micro blog when it started, and it just seems like there's a lot more blog functionality. I can pin a post to the top. Yeah, you can do that on blogs too. Yeah. But aren't they sort of like getting distancing the distancing themselves away from the simplicity of Twitter that made it so popular in the first place? It used to be just all about this timeline, and that your only your only variety was are you following one person's timeline or an aggregated timeline? Now, as you say, it's really looking a lot more like a Tumblr blog. It's actually, the, my first reaction is, hey, it's MySpace. Look at all those card, look at all those white boxes on a on a distracting background. Uh, as they try to blur the lines a little bit more, people are going to start to lose the distinction between their social connections via Twitter and via all the, what, the six, seven, eight, nine, ten other services they're using. There's also the ability to embed uh, tweets. If you, uh, I guess, now you have to click on the time, it changes to open, and then that opens the tweet. Then you have to click on the date. Wait, that didn't work. It just closed it. Uh, oh no, details. Right, and then I get the option to embed this tweet. So it's that oh. easy. Well, this is this is something oh. that's happened a lot. I mean, anytime somebody wants to go, oh, this person tweeted that, and you end up taking a screenshot, and that's not a, that's terrible for SEO. It's not good for Twitter as well. They can't find out what's going on. But once you have this embed code in there, they're able to track what's more popular. I don't know if what I'm concerned about is what if some if when somebody deletes that tweet, does it, does the embed code say like does it give you a 404 error? What happens at that point? Because at least with the screenshot. That's not going anywhere unless the, the mm. file itself is missing. Yeah, and a lot of times journalists are using uh, the screenshot to say, hey, hey, this is tweet's gone now, but here's, here's what it said. I wouldn't rely on the embed code for that because once it's deleted, they're not going to be able to, uh, to, to use it anymore. I, you know, I, I, I think, Andy, to, to get back to what you were saying about it being a, a simpler, uh, it used to be a simpler thing, Dorsey was trying to address that. Uh, in his announcement when he said, you know, Twitter isn't trying to get more complicated. We're trying to just make it simpler for you to find what you're looking for. So, so they're, they're in agreement with you, but they, they think that they're still doing that in, in just an easier way. And, and I get that the navigation is simpler. Home, connect, discover. Very, very easy to figure out what those mean. Uh, but then they've added so many options that you're right. It's not, it's not just the timeline anymore. Yeah. How, how, would you, how would you think that Twitter defines themselves these days? Like, do, are they are they really see? Are, do they see themselves as a big pool of discrete clippings of information that people will then search through? Are they do they think that the hashtag is now the interface instead of the timeline? You know, that's uh, he he actually said something. I'm going to try to see if I can find it that that spoke right to that because he's like Twitter is is this, and he he said you know we're about short messages. We're we're about uh, uh, just just quickly making short observations with each other and he said something about news TechCrunch had the yeah. uh, the quote in their live blog uh, but they they don't see themselves as competing with Facebook or Google Plus they don't see themselves as competing with blogs they see themselves as something entirely different yeah that's why I thought it was funny the idea of you have these 140 word uh, excuse me 140 character posts being represented by an embed code that has what 300 characters 400 <laughs> characters in it yeah I was more interested in, the, in the, there were some, some other details that, uh, or other things that Twitter released. I was more interested in the new version of TweetDeck. There's a new version on the web. There's, there are native clients now for OS X and, and XP, and uh, XP and higher. There's no Adobe Air anymore in these things. I mean, I thought Twitter, when they bought TweetDeck, I was like, when are they finally going to update it? And it's kind of snuck under the radar. I don't think a lot of people noticed it. Captions. That's what he was saying. Uh, uh, I think this was Dick Costolo. Uh, it's a universe within every tweet. Uh, your tweet is really a caption now, a caption that's associated with a rich canvas. 
Uh, and that, you know, that's I'm, he hasn't been, he hasn't been on Twitter in a while. If he's referring to it as a rich canvas, I'm paraphrasing from a live blog, so that may not be exactly his words. But I, you know, uh, that's sort of the upshot is they. I guess they see themselves as the the captions of the internet. Well, yeah, because it's 140 characters. That's how long the caption they're, is. They're captions of industry. <laughs> Oh, that's horrible. I appreciated that one. I thank, you. Was thank you. For the, we'll thank you for the courtesy snort. Captions. <laughs> uh, also, uh, let's see. What do we got? We, we talked about the brand pages. We talked about embeddability. I think that's that's pretty much it. Uh, they did also mention uh, today on TechCrunch that Twitter's traffic seems to have taken a big boost from being on the iPhone or being on iOS. Uh, they went in October to 3.7 billion page views, up from 3.3 billion in September, according to Comscore. And that number has stayed up. If you look at the graph, it's 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 not lagging. So uh, no, I don't think anybody thought it would be a bad thing for them to be integrated, but it has worked out as hoped, and it keeps going up. Well, then I guess, I guess Google Plus didn't take as big a hit out of them as people thought. I mean, that's when people were saying, oh, Google Plus, I use that instead of Twitter. Why would I want to keep using this? And that's pretty surprising to me, actually. OnLive has released uh, their apps for mobile devices. OnLive is the, the gaming uh, uh, service that allows you to play a game in the cloud. So they do all of the, the game running on their machine. And if you're in, I think it is like a thousand miles of the server, uh, you, can, you can play it remotely. Now, up till now, you've been able to play it on a de desktop, on a laptop, or on one of their consoles that they sell. Uh, but they've now put out apps for iOS and Android that allow you to play all 200 games and there's even a kindle fire app that's coming although that one will only be able to play a subset of the 200 games and you can buy for 50 dollars soon a bluetooth controller so that you're not only using a touch interface for these games but you can also use a regular old game console controller that that always seemed like a real great hook of on live when it came to that controller because i mean there are tablets out there android tablets and ipads and things but sometimes when you want to control a game Mm -hmm. Tilting the screen or not having tact a tactile feedback can really drive you nuts. And you're like, are my touches being, are they being registered or not? It's a small thing, but it's really important to, some, to me because Bluetooth will work on pretty much everything. That's the other thing. You don't need to have, oh, it's going to work with iPad? It's going to work with Android? Yeah, it'll probably run because it works with Bluetooth. And uh, Ben M in the chat room points out, combine that with AirPlay. AirPlay, yeah. Boom. Yeah, I mean, already already have a really great setup. With this way, you can almost have like a three a two screen display with two one one independent player screen, one communal screen, and now you no longer have to use that that separate iPad screen uh, just for doubling for controls. Uh, because remember, AirPlay can do mirroring, but you, the application can also have access directly to the to the screen of the uh, iOS device itself. So I don't think we've seen people uh, really exploit that yet. But that was the exact first thing I th I found about when I heard that uh, that it was coming to iOS. Oh, were you saying that you could use like an iPad, kind of like in a Wii U kind of configuration with AirPlay? Yeah, oh, you can, you can use them as in, as a matter of fact, uh, Scrabble. <laughs> one of the, one of the first really good demonstrations of this, uh, outside of AirPlay at least, was uh, the Scrabble game for iOS. Where if you have an if you and I both have iPhones and we have an iPad between us, we can use the iPad as the Scrabble board and use our phones just simply to ma to manage our individual tiles without showing each other's uh, uh, contents. I remember that so, I got razzed in, in the press was like some like replacing you know, a ten dollar game board with two thousand dollars worth of technology. Uh, but yeah, I, 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 I don't I, 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 I don't normally have a Scrabble board in my back pocket. I, I do have big <laughs> pants though. <laughs> so you could was what you're saying. You just you could. It's just heavy. Uh, you know, on live, I don't know if you guys have played it at all. I've, I've, I've had the service and I've played it and it works better than you would expect. It works well enough. Yeah. You feel like you're, you're playing a video game. You don't feel the lag. If you're a huge gamer who's really sensitive to lag and frame rate, you're not going to like it, uh, because it's not perfect, but it, it but it, it's playable. And this brings yeah. big name games like Arkham Asylum to your iPad, which is not going to happen in any other way. I, mean, this, I just wish it worked. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say this is pretty much like this is what I expect the future of consoles to be. It's all the heavy lifting being on data centers, so you're not worried about oh, when is the next Xbox coming out? When is the next PS3 coming out? Can my processor handle this? It won't matter if you're using their their actual player. Everything's on the other end, so it, it, all you're doing is you're just interacting with one device, and you don't have to keep upgrading your your device. I would imagine you'd have to. How would online keep making money? Just a subscription payment? That's all you're going to well, be doing? Well, yeah, and that's one of the stumbling blocks here is to, to buy access to the games, you have to go to their website and, and use their web interface because they're not participating in Apple's in-app payment program. They don't want to give away the 30% 
So they're actually uh, forcing you to, not, you be, and they have currently an app that's an online viewer. So essentially you can only use this new app as an online viewer unless you have a computer around to, to purchase the games. Uh, unless you purchase the, the service that gives you, you know, multi, access to multiple games. But you're not going to be able to play one game at a time this way. You're going you're gonna to have to sign up for, for ongoing service. But it's even cooler when you think about all the web-enabled TVs that are out there. That now, if you, it's almost impossible to spend a thousand bucks on a TV without getting Netflix embedded in it, without getting Pandora embedded in it. Now imagine that every 55-inch TV automatically has a client for this game system. So that, yeah, I'm sure that most people are already going to have two or three different game consoles already. But the idea that every single thing can conceivably not only access uh, cloud-based gaming of this caliber, but it now becomes irrelevant what console you're at, whose house you're at, uh, or even what hardware you're running it on. That's yeah, what and, even, really and even your internet connection. I mean, obviously you have to have yeah, it that, that, That's even decent. better for the living room. Yeah, yeah. because I, I, when I first tried it out, I didn't like it only because I was at a Panera <laughs> or I was at a Starbucks <laughs> when I tried yeah. it. And you really do have to be at home on Wi-Fi uh, at home, particularly connected via copper to get this to work great. When it works great, it works fantastic. We were, uh, yeah, Dan Ackerman, we were just showing from CNET, he, he, they did a test and they said when they were at work doing it on Wi-Fi at work, it, it didn't work so well. It was spotty. But then when they took it home, like you're saying, and even on Wi-Fi at their own house, it worked great. Yeah. So, it, you know, it's, it's, it's going to depend on your connection. But it, it can make use of connections that probably aren't the best connection that you can get. How would you think this is going to fare against the oncoming bandwidth caps? I mean, if you want to play all your stuff and everything's oh, coming yeah, out, streaming in, you're going to be pretty annoyed. You, that was five gigabytes of information? Ah, oh, no, no, no. You go from LNR drops into like side-scrolling Super Mario Land. Like, <laughs> sure, yeah. like, that would be the feature capped. of the game. It's like, it's only going to use one kilobit per hour. You're like, wow, it's really, it's Pong. <laughs> I, uh, I, I only got the, the cutscene. The I red didn't... dot represents the dead hooker that you're trying to solve the murder of. The <laughs> orange dot represents the drug runner you're trying to catch. That's... It's like Atari Adventure. It's <laughs> dream <laughs> in the future. All right, let's move on to Facebook uh, confirming uh, today that they have streamlined their product development process. They say, we have reorganized our technical teams into product groups that report into Mark Zuckerberg. These groups will be led by Brett Taylor, Chris Cox, Greg Badros, Mike Schrepfer, and Sam Lesson. So Facebook's sort of taking a page from Google here, trying to focus their efforts on different product areas. TechCrunch made a guess as to what these product areas would be based on what these folks that were named actually do now. Brett Taylor is the CTO. They're guessing he's in charge of mobile. Uh, Chris Cox is VP of product, so product. Uh, and then uh, Badros is ads and engineering. Uh, VP of engineering. Shrepfer would be in charge of engineering and Lesson in charge of timeline and profile. Now, they, they, they used communications and privacy as two examples of the groups. I don't see anyone in charge of privacy here. And we do know that they just promoted two of their lawyers to varying chief privacy officers of different types. So I don't know if they've consolidated that back into one person uh, or, or what. And they're not named in this TechCrunch article here as well. Uh, but I don't know that this is going to make a big difference in the way we use Facebook every day. It's just interesting to know that they're, they're following that trend now to streamline. Yeah, for, the, for the end user, they're not going to notice much. I'm thinking this is, this is just they're building towards that IPO. Everything is going to be public. They want to make sure everything's all their ducks are in a row to make sure that okay, look, we're a real company. We have we know who's accountable for what. Because I'm sure that if, at yeah. Facebook it was small enough that you probably could do like, at least at the top, you probably could just throw ideas off each other without titles. You probably didn't need that. At this kind of situation, when you're going to go public, you need to have like delineated rules and who's in charge of what. And so there's accountability in there. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 about communication with stockholders, and now you can simply say if there was if there were ever ever like a huge amount of downtime that really got uh, everyone's uh, gotten every uh, member of the press, they could simply say, oh well, we fired this guy, or we moved we moved somebody into this position at this new t at the at the at the hardware division or at the infrastructure division, whereas before all you have is Zuckerberg in the you know. Reca gymatorium at uh, at Facebook, yeah, awkwardly saying, "Well, we thought about this, and we really moved things, and we keep striving harder." No, nothing sends a message saying that this is the guy who's the head of this division. His feet are being held to the fire. He is forgiven his biz bonus, and he is about one step away from now sweeping the floors. We've streamlined our scapegoat infrastructure. Is what you're saying. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Effectively, yes. Uh, I've, I've 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 just realized that I don't like apologizing for things that I don't really feel are my fault anymore. <laughs> we need to. 
distribute the apologies. A dis distributed service. So I've decided to share my responsibility. We're going to go with a t-shirt system, much like in Starfleet. I wear the gold t-shirt. <laughs> you all have red shirts. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, Facebook also filed a counter lawsuit against Timelines.com. If you remember, Timelines.com originally sued Facebook over using the word timeline. There was an injunction that has expired, hence Facebook's ability to make timelines public now. Uh, the hearing has been delayed until January between those two, but Facebook filed a new uh, filing in court to be redundant. <laughs> Can't do anything but file a filing. Uh, and and uh, saying, asking the court to invalidate all of Timelines.com's trademarks uh, and providing all kinds of evidence of use of the, time, the word timeline generically in other situations. I mean, that's that's going to be Facebook's argument. They want to have the usage of timelines without having to pay a, a, a fee to timelines.com. But but timelines.com might, but they're probably going to argue, though, is that even though they, they have the registered mark, it could you can have a registered mark that is weak, a weak trademark. Now, it doesn't mean, when you have a fanciful title like iPod, it's a lot easier to... That's a strong Very trademark. strong one, because okay. there's no association necessarily. It's actually suggestive of, of a pod, I guess, would be the argument. Because Tide it's itself, that in school they taught us this, Tide was suggestive of cleaning clothes. I'm like, okay, not fanciful, apparently. The, the crazier the name, the stronger the, the, the trademark. But a weak trademark can still be valid. It's just, it's very hard to protect. So Facebook could easily call their thing Timeline without having to pay Timelines.com anything. But Timelines.com may still be able to keep their trademark. So, they, so what's the difference there? Why would, why would Facebook be allowed to keep calling their product Timeline if timelines.com keeps the trademark, that makes the trademark worthless. It's it's just weak. I mean, that's the. the it means it, you can't protect it against Facebook, but you could possibly. Could, if somebody's if they're dead on doing the exact, exact same thing as timelines.com, like I mean, this is a different use slightly of what of what uh, or how it's being used because there's also this example of like Buick aspirin versus the Buick the car. It's like you're never going to confuse these things. All right. Or the Linux, closer, Linux soap. Is the my closer favorite. the closer they get together in in uh, format and in style. That's when you start running into these issues. But uh, Facebook's got a pretty good argument as well. So we'll see what happens there. There's a, there's a hysterically funny example from a couple of weeks ago where an oil company created a division in Canada called Pixar Petroleum. <laughs> where it was just full on, oh, that's a good, we're naming all of our divisions against movie studios so we know like who's part of what group. And because it, it's, it's thought of that, although they obviously just simply took the name for Pixar, I don't believe that the name existed before they made it up, the fact that... They can't pick the Pixar, the film studio, could not make the argument that this oil company, and it was going to confuse the oil company for right. the people who did Up and Toy Story. So as a result, it's a pretty safe move, even though it's kind of a expletive <laughs> move. For the yeah, movie. yeah. Although a bunch of activists are now protesting against all Pixar films because, you know, they're run by they're big confused. oil. Right. <laughs> Let's take a break and uh, thank our sponsor for today's show, Epson Workforce Pro, the world's fastest two-sided inkjet printer. Uh, this holiday, you got tech gadgets, right? Uh, and so you got all those gadgets you want to get on your shopping list to give your family, friends, and coworkers. But what about gadgets for your business? Do you give your business a gift uh, and check out Epson's engineered Workforce Pro. It's engineered for productivity. Delivers high-speed, automatic, two-sided color printing, copying, scanning, and faxing. And when they say high-speed, they're not just throwing that around. I mean, that's that's the kind of word that gets uh, kind of overused. But it, it, it's fast. We, we've shown it on the show before. It actually does print for an inkjet printer, lightning fast. And it's got the ability to print over the network. You got it on a Wi-Fi network, and you got your phone or your tablet on a Wi-Fi network. You can print from the tablet to the printer, and not with any of those crazy network errors that you might be used to getting in other situations. It works really well. We've tried it out. We use it here. Uh, keeps your business running at full speed. And the ink cartridges have extra high capacity, meaning you have 50% less cost per page versus color laser. See, a lot of ink costs you less. It's, a, it's kind of a dream situation. Workforce Pro Prints for mobile devices, like I said, had a 580-sheet paper capacity. It's built to perform. The Epson Workforce Pro. Check it out at epson.com this holiday season, and we thank them for their support of Tech News Today. Onward and inward to Amazon uh, with what I think may be the stupidest direct publishing deal I've seen. A uh, $6 million <laughs> annual fund has been set up to fund KDP Direct. KDP stands for Kindle Direct Publishing. KDP Select, I, I said it wrong, KDP Select allows you to make your book available to the Kindle Lending Library. That's that new service that allows you to check out a book for a long time, uh, and then you can always return it and check out another book 
ebooks. Now, first of all, I think checking out ebooks is kind of a dumb idea anyway. I mean, it, they're ebooks, but whatever. Okay. So a lot of people are into this. Uh, and Kindle is uh, allowing independent publishers to join this service. So at first, I'm excited. I'm like, hey, I got a couple of independently published books. I'm going to get in on this. Then Ayaz points out to me, well, you have to make your book exclusively Kindle for 90 days. And I'm like, oh, you mean I have to make it available in the library for 90 days? That's fine. I can commit to three months. He's like, nope. no, exclusively to Kindle. The Kindle store, yep. And then suddenly it became the dumbest idea I've ever heard. Why would I stop making my book available in other places outside of Kindle just to have it lent? And this is how you get paid. They have $500,000 set aside for December. That's what that $6 million is for, to fund these different months. And you get paid based on your book share of the total number of borrowers of all participating KDP books in the Kindle owner's <laughs> lending library. Yeah. What, do you, what do you think, Andy? Am I, am I off base on this? It feels a little bit like volunteering to be part of a class action suit. <laughs> where you, you, know that you're, you're, you know you're getting that check for 89 cents from, from Benco Petroleum after, yeah. after the oil spill. Pixar. You just don't know where you're going to spend all that money. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, the, the, the only thing, the only saving grace to all this is that uh, if you really want to get into self-publishing digitally, the Kindle store is going to be 70 to 80% of your market to begin with. Um, I'm familiar with at least in the tech press what uh, what uh, tech books sell on the iBook store versus the Kindle store. Even the ones that are like Apple oriented, the ratio can often be as much as nine to one uh, between the sales to the Kindle store versus the sales to the iOS store. So it's not like uh, the iBook store. So it's not like it's crazy damn stupid. It's still crazy stupid. Um, although Amazon has, I mean, th it's it's quite a carrot to dangle in front of uh, anybody who's creating content. When they first came out with the uh, uh, the Amazon App Store. They were uh, they were really enticing a lot of developers to get into the well. Look, if you give if you let us use your app as one of our free apps for the day, it'll it'll give you one day full of mad madcap exposure, and then it'll it'll that'll be the the, the groundswell that you can base uh, your future success of. And pretty much every one of these developers are saying never again because it's endless support problems. Uh, it caused endless billing problems where they were not getting credited for legitimate sales after that. So. It's. I think this is a, this is a gold rush mentality. Where people think, well, if I'm going to get, I, I don't, I don't. Re uh, the secret to marketing my own stuff on the Amazon store is I don't want money. I want eyeballs and attention, which hopefully I can eat off of and use to pay my rent, my mortgage from this attention that I'm getting from lending library. And the Amazon press release, they're, they're trying to sweeten the deal. I mean, if, if you have to give your book up for 90 days or it's going to be exclusive for 90 days, they go with KDP Select. Authors and publishers will have access to a new set of promotional tools, starting with the option to promote their enrolled titles for free for up to five <laughs> days every 90 days. So yeah. you can promote the it, heck out of it for five days. Yeah. Special yeah. tools. If, 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 you're doing, if you're doing it right, you're, you don't, you're not using Amazon to promote your, your material. You're using your blogs, you're using your, your podcast, you're using every other opportunity you can. If you're expecting Amazon to help you sell your book, you are not going to do well self-publishing. You should go back and get your real estate license. The other thing is you get a royalty as each book is – after each time it's in Lent versus how publishers are getting paid. They get paid up front whether anybody actually lends the book or right, not. Right, because Amazon has yeah. to do it that mm -hmm. way if, unless they want to renegotiate, which they don't want to do. Uh, I, I guess if you were only publishing on Kindle through for whatever reason, that this would make sense. But since I, I publish all over the place and I make my book available for free, I have a free version available as a PDF because I buy into what Cory Doctorow says. You know, if you, if you Unless you're a huge popular author like Stephen King, and even maybe Stephen King, but most people will get a benefit out of circulating it for free because it gets more widely known. Uh, I, it would be idiotic to me to give that up for 90 days just yeah. to get a class action lawsuit 82 cent payment. It just, <laughs> it doesn't, the math doesn't work out to me. Maybe I'm wrong. But I'm probably not. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security has seized, uh, had seized Dajaz1, D-A-J-A-Z1 dot com, November 26th, 2010. It was part of a seizure of 81 sites accused of copyright infringement. Uh, DHS's, or the Attorney General Eric Holder had a big press announcement at the time saying, you know, copyright is theft and we're not going to let this go unpunished. And we're going we're to pin these guys to the wall. Uh, this is when they started using Immigration's uh, Custom Enforcement to seize websites and redirect their domain names to ICE, uh, those famous ICE uh, pages that tell you it's been seized. Well, it turns out the jazz1.com showed New York Times emails explaining that they had permission. They had been given 
these music files by the record companies in order to promote the records, doing exactly what we were just talking about, <laughs> giving away something for free to promote the saleable object. Uh, and so what the DHS did was, or, or I'm sorry, ICE did, was start filing court documents under seal so that nobody could investigate this case. Uh, they kept filing for extensions under seal so nobody could tell why they were asking for the extensions. And then today, the Department of Homeland Security abandoned the action, gave the site back no explanation yet as to what happened here. Uh, the DeJazz One website is back in the hands of its rightful owner. It sports a note saying it will return shortly, and they, have, of course, have a video of an anti-SOPA message, uh, the Stop <laughs> Online Piracy Act up there. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, this is just... A real example of when you don't have due process and proper oversight, you can absolutely ruin a website. And here, here they've, they've dropped the case, so they obviously didn't have a case. What's the remedy? They lost their, they lost their website. They lost their domain name for over a year. Redirect. You go to dhs.org or .gov and they send you to DJS. <laughs> I mean, like, I, how are you going to make them whole? You're going to have to do a t like a promotional campaign. It's going to be very difficult. The crazy thing is they had permission to get some of these songs, a promotional uh, thing yeah. so like I mean just being able to say hey look we have the rights to this apparently but doesn't that's work. the problem with the way ICE is doing this is you don't have the chance to say that it's just it, yeah. that's that's the absurdity of this and that's why like it's good that the story came out because this is kind of a <laughs> if you can't actually like appeal if you can't have recourse what do you do you just you, you just set up to jazz too I mean, yeah. you have to set up another site. You have to, you, I, I, I say that as a joke, but I, there's a bit of seriousness there. You have to reestablish yourself on the web with a new address, the same I mean, new contacts, all kinds of things just to keep yourself going. And, and you have to explain to your clients, oh, yeah, why our site is down? How, how do you even explain to, to these musicians, oh, yeah, the, the ICE took it down? Yeah, that's why, so that's why it's doubly damaging. If, if let's say that uh, police break into your house, make an arrest, seize, uh, seize your material, there's a legitimate and well-established procedure where you don't don't shoot it out let them do what they're going to do because they've got the papers and they've also got the the gas masks but at some point when your stuff is returned to there's a manner of recourse where you could simply say look you got to prove now I, w I want access to this documents i want access to whatever reports that these guys were making i want to know what, exactly what happened with my with my hardware and there's also a way that you can if luck is on your side make things so bad not only for the county but also for the careers of the people who actually initiated this this action that before that person files that next piece of paper they're going to think twice about doing it right now as in the chain of events that have been defined right now about this seizure there was no negative impact for whoever simply said oh this guy is helping us uh, to helping uh, uh, promote uh, 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 piracy and so we have to shut them down so that means that you can do a tactical takedown just as a civil uh, just as a civil matter just because you think that well these guys are operating a forum that are that are they're being used for people who don't like our artists or basically everybody who signed to our label this is a forum for people who hate our stuff they get retweeted they get facebook they get they get posted everywhere we need a way to shut them down i know we'll have our lawyer claim that there is we'll, we'll have a, a user post a link to someplace on file crop or whatever uh, where someone can download something illegally that will cause them to be so disrupted for about a year and three months until this all, all gets sorted out that they will never be able to regroup they they know they're never they're not going to win this suit they're just doing it to be disrupted that's what's so scary about all this. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we've learned from the Viacom case against YouTube that these organizations often have one hand doing one thing while the other hand doesn't know what the yeah. other hand is doing, I think is how that phrase goes, right? Uh, right. I mean, no. <laughs> I mean, time and time again, you, you'll 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 see these marketing guys who are just going to put a clip up illegally because they're, they're not trying to trick anybody, but they know that if they get permission to put this behind the scenes clip up, they're not going to get that permission. It doesn't make any difference to anybody, and we'll get some maybe some heat uh, and some link bait for what they're doing. But then if three months from now someone can say, "Hey, look, there was this, there was no authorization for this clip, and you linked to it. Congratulations! The government now owns your Hello Kitty fan site." The RIAA told CNET's uh, Declan McCullough, uh, for a year and a half we monitored this site, identifying instances where its operators had uploaded music to unauthorized file sharing services where the recordings could be freely downloaded. And they go on to talk about 2,300 songs and links to pre-release copies. And we are unaware of a single instance where the site operator objected to takedowns by saying that the distribution was somehow authorized. The thing is, nowhere in this paragraph do they combat the fact that the Jazz One had been authorized. I mean, just because they had 23 recordings doesn't mean they weren't authorized. Just because they were using a, uh, a mega upload type site to host it doesn't mean they weren't authorized. And just because the Jazz One didn't object when a song was taken down, because this probably happens to them all the time, 
doesn't mean it wasn't authorized. It doesn't get to the heart of the matter, which was they were doing apparently an approved thing. At least, at least they thought they were. And I, I, I think the fact that the DHS dropped the case means that there at least is some doubt as to whether they could prove in court that they weren't doing an approved thing. I don't get yeah, now, it. Now, now where's that guy go now? Exactly. Well, he, no, he, goes, he lost a year of his life. Where does he go now? It, it or, goes, excuse me, l l year of his sight's life anyway. <laughs> hey, yeah, what is the remedy? Oh, I, uh, I, can, he, still... can he bring a lawsuit against the DHS for, you know, or the RIAA for wrongfully imprisoning his sight? I mean, I mentioned tortious interference of, of, uh, of like, I'm blanking right now, tortious interference of, of business for this kind of thing. So, I mean, if, if this is, the thing is, DHS is going to argue sovereign immunity. I mean, you can always, if you're like the government, you can always say, well, we did it because we wanted to, and it's okay. It's one of these big issues in, in law. Um, should we talk more about court stuff? Yes, let's uh, move on to an Oregon judge. Uh, ruling that a blogger, at least in this case, was not a journalist. And it's got a lot of people talking, but let's, let's figure out what's going on here. Montana woman named Crystal Cox started several websites accusing an Oregon firm, Obsidian Finance Corp., and its principal, Kevin Padrick, of misconduct in their handling of a bankruptcy case. Uh, she started inflammatory websites like obsidianfinancesucks.com, bankruptcytrustyfraud.com, oregonshyster.com. Uh, in January, Padrick filed a defamation lawsuit against Cox, charging her accusations were false and asking for $10 million in damages. Last month, the jury found Cox guilty, awarded Padrick and his firm $2.5 million in damages. Uh, Oregon law requires victims of defamation by journalists to first request a retraction, though, and Patrick never did that. It also protects journalist sources, so Cox asked the judge to set aside the verdict, claiming she was a journalist. She called herself an investigatory blogger. Uh, judge Marco Hernandez, however, has disagreed. He said, although the defendant is a self-proclaimed investigative blogger and defines herself as media, the record fails to show that she is affiliated with any newspaper, magazine, periodical, book, pamphlet, news service, wire service, news, or feature, syndicate, broadcast station, or network or cable television system. Thus, she is not entitled to the protections of the Oregon Journalist Shield Law. It looks like they took the journalist definition out of the Mac Dictionary. A person who writes for newspapers <laughs> or magazines and prepares news to be broadcast on radio or television. It's like That's uh, the Oregon law. The Oregon law says that, you know, it is defined by these, but not limited to, right. these things. So, so she's saying, hey, it's not limited to, I'm a blogger. Is a blogger or journalist? I mean, I think they give different press credentials at CES. They used to, anyway. Well, they were different. Yeah, but is a gadget get a journalist or a blogger uh, credential? Does TechCrunch get a journalist or a blogger credential? And Andy, you you keep a blog. Do you get a blogger or a journalist? I mean, the lines are blurred. <laughs> the New York Times is running on WordPress, which is a blog. That, 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 that's why, in a large in a larger sense, I could see both sides of this because. Uh, uh, journalism is these days is more of, of uh, a, a question of attitude and professionalism than anything else. But how do you, is there any possible way to discern someone who, uh, someone like John Gruber, who runs a very, very good news site that a lot of people rely on and quote. I mean, Steve Jobs was quoting uh, John Gruber, uh, one, a couple of things he was posting. He is definitely, he would definitely uh, at the very minimum be accorded the level of a regular op-ed columnist for any large city newspaper. Uh, but how do you discern between someone like him who has a large degree of professionalism with somebody who just has a, just just has a Tumblr blog, just spouts his mouth off saying whatever he wants about anything, and then when someone says, okay, you know what, you actually did about $280,000 worth of damage to my business. I lost two contracts because you kept insisting these things that you knew were false, that I proven to you were false, and that you promised me you'd never say again. You can't just then go running for the protection of, oh, I'm a journalist, I'm doing journalism, You're protecting. I'm, this is free you can you make a free speech claim, but if you want to claim to be shielded by the same laws that protect journalists from being hunted by governments and, and, and administrators, that's crossing a little line. So it's, it's such a hard thing to try to determine, isn't it? It, it is. And it's funny. I read the CNET article on this by Stephen Musil, uh, and he brings up the fact uh, that Bruce Johnson, an attorney from Washington, felt like Oregon's law is a little outdated. And he believes that the shield law would have been applied to Cox if this had been tried in Washington instead of Oregon. But when you read the Ars Technica uh, uh, article written by Timothy B. Lee, uh, he brings up the fact that uh, there was an email uncovered by Kashmir Hill at Forbes, which showed that Cox had actually contacted uh, Patrick 
when the suit was first filed, asking uh, if he would take if he would pay her twenty five hundred dollars, uh, she would give him PR services, which essentially meant she would oh. take down the websites. So, <laughs> well, I mean, okay. can, can a jerk be a journalist? How about that? I mean, if a person's a going jerkalist, <laughs> effectively, I, can, I, can I mean, this, that's true. This <laughs> yeah, person is it, it, it doesn't look like she's got the the, the best. Um, I don't know, morals on this kind of subject. But or at least ethics, yeah. Ethics, thanks. Uh, that's the word I was looking for. Uh, if that's the case, can she still be a journalist, though? I mean, just because you write a string or you have these idiotic posts, could one post be enough to make you a journalist? I say, look, I really was uncovering something. This was a big deal. Yeah, I, it's but the the fact of journalism should not be whether uh, the facts turned out to be true. It's it's all about the reasonableness of your belief that the facts are true. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of good law about that. Mm -hmm. uh, however... I think what we're dealing with here is somebody who very clearly was not a journalist before she started exposing this. This was a whistleblower, if, if nothing else. And and it seems from the case that maybe what she was saying didn't turn out to be true, because I don't think she, they, they can prove defamation if everything she said was true, although there, there are exceptions to that, I know. Uh, however, you could still, if she was writing for, you know, the Montana Times... Uh, she could still be protected as a journalist for everything she said because she worked for the Man Montana Times. I think what we're dealing with here is that Blogger is is a is a service from Google. Blog, you know, be having a blog is a publishing method. Uh, the question is no longer are you a blogger or a journalist. The question is what is journalism? Where do we draw the line? Yeah. When are you part of an organization and an ethical tradition that deserves the extra protections that have been given to it by the law? And when are you just, uh, you know, a pamphleteer, for lack of a better word, somebody who's out there just, you know, say, putting out what they want to say, and, and you're only protected by free speech. Yeah. My problem with this, this decision was that it wasn't very clear whether the judge was saying that uh, bloggers aren't journalists or whether the, the judge was saying that this blogger is not a journalist. And yeah. it's an important distinction. I think that's one of the reasons I wanted to bring this up, because a lot of these headlines say, you know, blogger not eligible for media shield law, which makes people think, oh, bloggers are not eligible. And the, it's, it's a very important uh, non-plural case there. Uh, it, it is this person has been deemed not a journalist, essentially, by the court. All right, let's move on to the news views. <laughs> Google debuted its new reader product today called Google Currents. Uh, the new product will be available on Android and iOS devices like Flipboard, Yahoo Livestand, and AOL editions before it. It's an attempt to make news feeds more pleasurable to read, whether they're journalists <laughs> or bloggers. Uh, Google Currents will debut with 100 50 partners. I, you know what? I don't use these things. I, I think they're great looking. But it's because you don't, you don't relax. You should relax. And Maybe I need to. Is enjoy your content this way. You need way. to lean back. It's not just about reading your feeds for, for news. Just read them for fun. Mm. It's a, it's a thing. It's a weird thing I'm, I'm promoting today. <laughs> Cult of Mac reports AT&T Wireless has started enforcing its throttling policy on the top 5% of users with unlimited accounts. A text message arrives informing the offending user, your data usage is among the top 5% of users. Data speeds for the rest of your current bill cycle may be reduced. It should say congratulations, I think, but it doesn't. AT&T <laughs> announced the policy in July. Checkpoint, level up. <laughs> Subscribers with limited data plans are unaffected. If they hit their limit, they just get charged more. And as we have seen recently, this probably won't alleviate the congestion problems anyway. Rumors of Miyamoto's retirement are somewhat exaggerated. Wired published an interview where the famous inventor of Mario told how he always tells people he's retiring as a way to prepare them to take his place. And then he separately indicated that he wants to start working on smaller projects in the future and change what he does at Nintendo. This has Nintendo scrambling to combat the headlines reporting that Miyamoto is quitting. He is not. You might have heard of Amazon's price price check deal that gives shoppers to perform a price check using Amazon's <laughs> barcode scanning app, a $5 discount on Amazon, up to five, 15 bucks. That, well, you know what? The Retail Industry Leaders Association is not too happy, as you might guess, and put out a statement accusing Amazon of evading the payment of taxes and all kinds of horrible things and kicking puppies. Why are you laughing so much? No, it's, it's just I, I love how how gutsy Amazon is about these things where it's not, it's not enough that, I, and I, I don't, I, I think that in the current climate, it's okay that they not collect sales taxes, but until the, until the, there's a law that a national law that says that how this thing should be collected. But it's like, you know what? Not only are we going to like totally kick the butt of local retailers, not only are we going to give people like an app so they can actually just do a barcode scan and we can tell them how much cheaper we are. We're actually going to monetize and profitize these, these things. We can make sure that if someone's going to buy a two ninety five. <laughs> 
a pair of sweat socks <laughs> that we will pay them twelve dollars just to make jc penny upset at losing the sale that's well and jason calcandis today is pushing the rumor that amazon's going to start brick and mortar uh retail locations. they don't have to with this promotion yeah, <laughs> every store is great. an amazon store to yeah. scan it Google has pulled the visual voicemail app Umail from the Android marketplace, and Umail says they were given no notice about why, but only told that T-Mobile USA requested the action because it felt the application was adversely affecting the T-Mobile network. No other carriers have complained, and the app is still available in the Amazon Android marketplace. How dare Apple not release things on the same date every year? How dare they? How could they do this? City analyst Richard Gardner claims the iPad 3 will launch sometime in February. That's a month earlier than Apple showed off the iPad 2 and a month later than the original iPad. So this is not helping us. Jan John Pazlowski. Pazlowski. What you said. And it, all things deep points out Steve Jobs' birthday is February 24th. Sorry, John. I apologize. Uh, what, what do you think, Andy? We gonna, does this matter even? We're no. going to get one in the spring, right? We're, we're going to get one almost certainly in the spring. And as with anything with Apple, we will get it about two weeks after they decide it's time to go. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that it's, it's even possible to predict within, uh, within more than a month uh, when they're going to make any sort of announcement. City of Cupertino published more details on Apple's enormous new circular headquarters on Tuesday. Forbes reports that much of the new details are about when the trees will blossom. Uh, the campus will be covered in cherry, plum, and apricot trees, which will blossom in carefully scheduled coordination to accompany the press to a new corporate auditorium, probably sneezing and covered in dead leaves. And Jane, I believe that her handbag clasp is made of solid pewter sculpted by Dijon. Any news on the shoes yet? Andy, who are you wearing? Yeah, I think it's like if we're, 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 we're definitely, it's definitely time to like to leave early for Christmas break if we're starting to think of well, what, what kind of trees and well, what, what, what time are they going to be blooming? Are, these, are the apricots going to be blooming near the rose petals? These details are probably agonized over. You're just diminishing they them. Were. How dare That's you? That's the thing. They were. They absolutely were. Okay, then I'm going I'm to butcher some French here. The, the Tribunal de Grande... Grande, it's in Spanish. Grande Instance de Paris. <laughs> El Tribunal. <laughs> well, they're, they're part of the EU. Uh, them, they've uh, denied Samsung's request for preliminary injunction against the iPhone 4S. Samsung now owes Apple 100,000 euros. And so the patent wars continue. <laughs> wow, that was a reverse one. Nice. Just like a stamp. This next story is not part of the patent wars, though. Wall Street Journal reports <laughs> that Chinese hardware vendor ZTE will debut a new line of high-end smartphones in the U.S. next year. ZTE America President Li Xing Cheng said by 2015, we expect the U.S. to be the largest market for handsets for ZTE. Well, if they run Android, maybe they'll get sued by Microsoft and we can use that patent wars thing again. Hey, yeah, exactly. Do -do 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 -do. Reverse invasion, though. ZTE coming over here instead of us always sending phones over there. They really have phones over here, just not the high-end stuff. Yeah. Let's check the randomizer. Randomizer. What is it spitting out today, Ayaz? Uh, lab finds smudge-free coding for touchscreens. Tell me more. That's pretty much all you need to know. <laughs> that is pretty much all, the, all It's I all in the to. headline. I love this idea. It's a simple yep. thing. Instead of having smudges all over your touchscreen, as touchscreens get larger and larger... You know when you you have your iPad and you just kind of tilt it back and you go, oh, that's disgusting. <laughs> this is this is this is a, a new technology that's supposed to remove. Well, it's supposed to be smudge free from now on. So I, I want this on everything. Scientists held a glass slide over a candle so it could collect soot at the right size, spheres between 30 and 40 nanometers. And to ensure the soot wasn't washed away, they coated the slide with a thin silica shell, baked the whole thing at 600 degrees Celsius uh, to make it transparent. Once it was out and cooled, they tried spraying it with very o various oils, and the microscopic photos showed the oil droplets bouncing off the surface. The coating doesn't just repel oil, but also organic substances. Ugh. It's actually good for, for security, too. As I know well. a lot of people with Android phones, or if you use a pin on your iPod or iPhone, they can figure out where you've pressed because it's the same you know, mm. fingerprints everywhere. Oh, look, you have a Z pattern. And they just had to figure that out. I mean, if you don't have that smudge, you're a little bit more secure. Excited by this, Andy? My question is, where is this oil going after it bounces off the... <laughs> <laughs> thing. I'm glad you mentioned that. We're going wondering... to be seeing, like, in any, like every Starbucks, there's going to be, like, baby seals smothered in oil, gasping for breath, and then whose fault is it going to be? It's going to be all over the tables and the chairs and your clothes. Cause it, it makes it sound like it's just splattering. It's At least bouncing. now we're collecting it in one neat place. <laughs>
Well, then you got you got to coat everything with this stuff so it continuously falls off of oh, falls off my touchscreen onto my keyboard onto the desk. There'll just be a, a constant spray of oil in the air. <laughs> wow, this sounds great. The this more we gotten, talk about it's it, it's gotten quite disgusting. Yeah. I didn't. Thanks for, for ruining my dream. one really unlucky guy in town. He's got like the lowest point. His basement is just covered with oil from the <laughs> fingerprints of everybody who owns an iPhone, an HTC, or a Samsung. It, it could be like area. biodiesel, though. Maybe the oils could be used exactly. for something. There you go. Yeah, collected, I'll just hold a, hold a funnel near the greasiest guy I know, and then you can start a new biodiesel firm called he, Pixar. He can, the best, the best, the best chicken restaurant in the entire town That's is going true. to be at the lowest geographical point of the <laughs> iPad grease fried chicken. Come and get it. Uh, let's check the calendar. Kotaku reports that Razer's Blade gaming laptop, that's the one with a couple of OLED keys and a touchscreen touchpad, will be available for pre-order in the next few days and will be delivered by Christmas. Ooh, thanks, Santa. One of Christmas of this year. Tomorrow, December 9th, is the status hearing of the Depart on the Department of Justice's case against AT&T's acquisition of T-Mobile. Also tomorrow, Grand Central Terminal's Apple Store opens. Now, the journalists got a sneak peek of it, and you can take a few looks at these things. It just looks like they put... Uh, <laughs> Did you get to go into it, Andy? Put tables right into the... Grand no, I, I, I haven't been, but yeah, uh, all the pictures I've seen from people, from people I know who have been there, it's like... Okay, it looks like pretty much every, it almost looks like a flash mob version of like an Apple store at Grand Central where everyone said, "Okay, everyone bring a table, a t-shirt and an iPad." Right. At 12:50, we start playing the Munchkin song and then <laughs> we start selling iPads. I can't wait for there to be for there to be really long lines and they're clogging up Grand Central Terminal. That'll be great for commuters, I think. Uh, attention dissatisfied Jawbone up owners, Jawbone is offering a refund between December 9th and December 31st. Get this, you don't even need to return the band if you don't want to. You can just complain. You can and, keep the broken thing and uh -huh. get your money back. That's right. Nice. So effectively it's free Jawbones for all. Let's check what's incoming. Incoming message. Is that Worf? I think that is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, um, yeah we've mentioned that before. And just every, I was watching uh, Star Trek movies last night. They were doing a marathon on HBO Family. Oh, yeah. And, and, and did he say, incoming message? And you were like, first email? Oh. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Wolf. First email from Bob in Cuyahoga Hall Falls, Ohio. Uh, he says, hey, guys, if the Apple TV is rumored to cost twice as much as a current TV, what are the chances that Apple will use an advanced display technology like AMOLED or another technology that would justify the higher price? I could see Apple producing hardware with an absolutely gorgeous screen that includes special features like Siri, AirPlay, apps, and the iTunes Store, but still still keeps the current Apple TV set-top box to provide some of the same features for older TVs or cheaper sets. Apple likes to control the high end of any market it enters, so I think this rumor of an expensive line of TV sets is very probable if they include an advanced display technology along with Apple iOS features. No. Well, not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't do it on their phones. They're not going to do it for a TV. And the other thing is just raising up the price of the TV because MLA technology is not cheap. I mean, Apple's about profit margins, right? That's the thing with that's you you pay a premium because they like that's where they make their money. It's on the profit of the hardware. And if your hardware is more expensive, yeah, sure, you can justify a higher price, but you're not going to get more profit out of it. Yeah. Also, they can make a 55-inch TV and sell it for sixteen hundred, seventeen hundred, eighteen hundred dollars. They will not be the most expensive TV even in a mainstream store. And they're not bang on Olufsen, so they're they're not going to put this feature in just so they said that we have the most expensive uh, screen out there. Uh, given that this is a display that's going to be observed from like eight to ten feet away, I don't think they're going to put money in a place where people are not going to be able to see it. Do you do you have a good guess at what television or if a television product is coming from Apple in 2012? I'm leaning towards yes now because I'm getting uh, distant early warning signs from yeah. certain outposts that have gone from just weird unattached rumors to one person says one thing and that kind of clicks into something I heard independently from someone else when I was talking to him about it. And I still don't know whether it's a 2012 thing or a 2015 thing, but it seems to be getting a little, it seems to be building up steam. It certainly wouldn't be an $800 screen though. It would be like one of those 55 inch, $1,600 ones that hopefully will do everything. I think we need one of those beautiful mind type layouts where we just have like all of the little pieces of the rumors and string connecting them and and just slowly filling in the We gaps. need to compare them with the iPad rumors and then compare them with the oh, iPhone. That's a good idea. Because the thing is, for years, like, they're working on a phone. No, they're not. We're working on a phone. They're working on Intel. No, no, they're not. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, I want one of those virtual rooms, like so I can do just that that garrison scene from JFK, where I can just like yes. point at things with my umbrella, say, "Over there, that's the lunch counter where where an engineer who specializes in nothing but bandwidth maximizes technology was talking to an OLED manufacturer." <laughs> then two doors over there, that's the office where people were playing ping pong. But who walks in one of them ping pong places? It's a guy who does nothing but custom LED bezel displays. But the rumor Follow came the from two angles, Andy. How how is that exactly. possible? <laughs> the IR the, the IR remote went back and to the left <laughs> before it hit the sensor. Uh, next email, last email, from Mike, the tech manager in uh, southeast Wisconsin, I guess, or SE, whatever that stands for. at t crew, just my own thoughts about the Verizon NFC mess. I joined Verizon two years ago with a Palm Pre Plus. Yes, pity me. Lo loved the phone, actually, but found that none of the GPS apps would work. Google Maps, Foursquare, etc. After much consternation, I found that the fix was to start the Verizon Navigator app, a paid, paid app for $9.95 a month, but then close it without accepting the terms and conditions to pay the monthly fee. The GPS would work for a while before it would shut down again. <laughs> Many months of finger pointing between Verizon and Palm, with Verizon claiming it was a phone issue, even though other Palm pre-carriers never had this problem, and Palm blaming Verizon Navigator. Looks like another case of Verizon crippling a feature that competes with its own. Two years later, waiting for my contract to end so I can buy the Galaxy Nexus. And now I'm afraid I'll just be climbing into, this, into a new crapware wagon. Maybe I'll just go with a droid razor. You know, Verizon isn't nearly as bad as it used to. This the email kind of brought it all back, how they used to really cripple their phones. Yeah, That's why a, they never had any good yeah. phones. I had a Motorola razor, and you couldn't load... You could not load your own ringtones on Yeah, you it. couldn't put your own music on We couldn't put your own ringtones on an iPhone originally. Well, I mean, you yeah. could do it on the singular Razor thing. It's just kind of like this. The other carrier didn't do this. Yeah, Verizon always, like, they crippled the Bluetooth and yep. Yep. all kinds of stuff. All right, well, that's it for this episode of Tech News Today. Uh, don't forget to jump in there every day at technewstoday.reddit.com and let us know what kind of stories you're interested in hearing us talk about. We use this to help us decide what goes into the show every day. Uh, so vote stuff up and down, submit stories, do all of that stuff. Join 3,600 other Redditors in there, technewstoday.reddit.com. Also, don't forget, if you're around Monday, December 19th, between 12 and 1 p.m. Pacific, that's 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern, and I think 8 to 9 p.m. UTC. I'm not sure exactly on that one. I might be wrong. But if you are around at that time, uh, we are going to do an open mic show. So let us know before then. In fact, let us know as soon as possible if you would like to be on the show. We're going to have three listeners, three fans on the show for a conversation. It's our second annual open mic show uh, that will be airing over the holidays. Uh, email TNT at twit.tv and use the subject line open mic 2011. MIC is how we want it. We'll, we'll accept MIKE, but... You will not be disqualified. The Don't filter worry. has been programmed to get MIC, so we'll have a better chance of seeing your submission if you do it that way. And Andy and Akko, thank you so much for being on the show. A pleasure uh, to be doing TNT with you. I've, I've been on a couple other the Mac Break Weeklies and special coverages and stuff. Uh, it's great to have you along today. It's a lot of fun. Thanks, guys. Let folks know where they can find uh, your work online and where to follow you and all that stuff. Uh, you can find me at suntimes.com. If you can spell my last name, you can check out my Twitter feed at Anatko uh, or my blog at anatko.com. If you can't spell my last name, which is more likely, uh, cwob.com will connect you to the same things. That's for the, my celestial waste of bandwidth. Excellent. Thanks, everybody, for listening or watching. You can find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us, TNT at twit.tv, and give us a call. Leave us a voicemail message, 260-TNT-SHOW, a free local call in Butler. Indiana. Darren Kitchen joins us tomorrow. We'll see you then.